Testament reading and preaching text comes from Genesis chapter 17. We're going to read verses 1 through 7 and then 15 through 16. This summer um, and last fall, last spring, um, the sanctuary was closed to all, except for the people who were putting on the service and video recording it. And I want to tell you, it was the strangest thing in the world to preach and to, for our choir to sing and everyone to speak and see nobody out, out here. But there was one thing that we enjoyed. You know what that was? When we made a mistake, we could fix it. We could say, hey, John, you know, let's, uh, let's reshoot that. And the choir one time, they wanted to re-sing something, and we all stopped for other things. And when I was making, when I finished my announcements today, I realized that would have been one of those moments where I said, oh, the main thing I wanted to say, I forgot to say. And that had to do with what I was talking about with COVID in these last times. There are things that may need to be attended to during this time, and one of the ones that we're really concerned about is mental health. If you are facing challenges, if you're realizing, I'm darker and, um, and more sad than is healthy to be, please don't let this just go on. This may be a time where you have to be separate, but it is not a time where you have to be alone. Um, Make sure that you're reaching out to people who can help you. Make sure you're reaching out to others um, that may not be doing okay. And if you don't have anybody to reach out to that can help you, please do not hesitate to contact our church. Our staff care about you. We want to be involved in you, with you. We want to help see things through. So um, it's, again, the separation can be difficult, but loneliness can be really trouble during this time. So make sure that um, if you're dealing with something, that you have someone in your life that's helping you through. Genesis 17, 1 through 7, and then 15 through 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you. And kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And now jumping ahead to verse 15. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. I want you to think about what you do when you read a biblical text. Right when you get done or right when you're going through, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Think about that. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you're reading the Bible? For many of us, it is, what's that? What does that mean? What does that have to do with this? So we're either confused by a word or a phrase. Sometimes we're confused by the whole thing. We didn't know what any of it meant. There is something about us as humans that are drawn to these things that we don't know. And you know, I think that's a real good thing about us. We have a curiosity to understand that leads us in good directions and leads us to try to find things out. But when it comes to understanding the Bible, this desire to hone in immediately on what we don't understand can get in the way of really understanding. 
Some of you have been trained in Bible study. Others of you uh, understand the scientific method. And instead of focusing on what you don't know, often it's really important to say, well, what do we know? How do we understand the parts that we understand? Because often in a biblical text, the other things around it will help us understand what's going on, will help us figure it out. Other times, we minimize the value of something that has great depth. Instead of letting the depth of a phrase or a word uh, play into the whole meaning of what's going on, we say, oh, we know what that is, and kind of fly over it. This is the challenge in our text today. In our Genesis passage, God appeared before Abram and declared, I am God Almighty. If you've been in church for a while, or you've studied the Bible, or you've studied the concept of the Hebrew and Christian God, this might be one of those things that you just kind of flew right over. You thought, I got this. But my question for us today is, are we sure? Are we sure that's something we can just sail by? God does some amazing things in today's scripture. But the most amazing thing he does is declare who he is. We're going to talk about lots of stuff in this text. But the most important thing that we're going to talk about is the proclamation, I am the God Almighty. That's where we're going to spend most of our time today. That's where we're going to live in this text. Other than God, everyone else in this scripture is suspect. We've got a 99-year-old man with no children. Therefore, from his point of view at this time and the point of view of his community, he's about to disappear. He's about to go away and will have no effect. He also has no land. I can't state this strongly enough that in this culture to have no land usually meant You didn't matter. You didn't exist. And it greatly affected your ability to to even survive. Um, I read a stat one time that our best guess, and, you know, looking back this far, it's kind of hard, but there are things we can base it on. But their best guess is like 93% of the people were involved in agriculture. And even those, um, there were a lot that were just subsistence farmers living hand to mouth. And... um, You know, even if uh, you did own land, it could be really hard. But if you didn't, there was almost nothing else you could do. And the other jobs that were offered, um, very few of them meant anything lucrative. It was really hard to get by. The other character in the text is Sarai. She was barren at 90. Let's talk what that meant in her culture. If you've seen the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, uh, then you saw the main character, Tula Portocollis. So Tula was trying to explain what was expected of Greek women, and she said, nice Greek girls are supposed to do three things in life. Marry Greek boys, make Greek babies, and feed everyone until the day we die. In a lot of ancient cultures, Make babies. No, no, not babies. Sons was what mattered. And if you didn't do that, nothing else really mattered. You didn't control your marriage. Your father probably set all that up. Maybe your oldest brother, if your father wasn't around. In fact, if we'd read about Abraham and Sarai's marriage a little earlier, we'd realize she really had nothing to do with it. But above everything else, you needed to produce sons to have meaning. How sad it is now that we know the science of this. How many women were scorned or worse for not producing the right gender. Something that we now know is controlled by the male. Although we know it was probably a medical problem for her because Abram had a a son with another woman In her day, and until really recently, this didn't matter. If sons didn't happen, 
in this culture, she wasn't living up to her part of the bargain. These two are unimpressive. They don't have what they're supposed to have. They are struggling. And into their world, God announces, I am the Lord Almighty. I am God Almighty. You know, I wonder if they were tempted to say, well, that's just great because that really hasn't helped us so far in life. But in this scripture, everything flows out of that statement. Everything is based on that statement. And because this statement is true, good can happen that isn't possible. Because this statement is true, everything bad that happens isn't final. Because of who God is, it requires a response on Abraham. And one of the commentators I read this week said, we need to understand those responses in this way. When God said to him, walk before me, he was likely talking about as if Abram had come in front of a king that ruled over him, responding to a summons. He's saying to him, be available on my terms. I'm sure those of us in this room with authority issues are already being tripped by that. But the difference here is when God makes this announcement, it sets everyone free. The second thing he says to Abram is be blameless. This is one of those uh, phrases that when we hear, you know, it sounds like another one of those impossible requirements Uh, set out by a power-wielding God. But it's actually not a call to moral purity. It's a call to be completely devoted in unqualified loyalty. Think about it from their point of view. They know what it is to be loyal to only one king. That's what God is asking from them. He's saying, I'm your king. Be loyal to me alone. Both of these requirements are what a king might impose over a subject. God is speaking to Abram in words he understands, in situations he understands, in experiences either he himself has been in or at least he understands because he is familiar with them. And he lays out a covenant, which was kind of their word in their day for contract between he and Abram. This contract will be between God, the superior, and Abram, the inferior. This contract will make Abram numerous, the father of kings and kingdoms, the ancestor of nations, exceedingly fruitful. But there's a problem, isn't there? He doesn't have any children. How is this going to happen? But all of this is in the context of God being the Almighty. This can't happen because of these two, Abram and Sarai. It can only happen because of an Almighty God. Now, we've talked about covenants before. If uh, you've come here for the last year while I've been your pastor, I've talked about them at least once, maybe a few more times. But if we were living in Abram's day, this would be just something we were very familiar with. Like we're kind of familiar with contracts today, you know. And some can be a big deal, like, um, I don't know, a contract between nations or something like that. And some can be a real small deal, like, you know, when you're joining a gym or something like that or getting cable service. Uh, Covenants defined an agreement between two or more people. Uh, Often it was a business relationship. Uh, Often it was renting land, uh, and it talked about what would have to happen and how the the parties would interact. Other times it would be for the delivery of um, some product, fruits or vegetables, grains. um, It could even be wool or something like that. Other times they were defined as uh, a social relationship. Marriages often had a covenant uh, set up. And one family would be required to do one thing, and the other family would be required to do the other. And then some of them were even combinations of all this. 
Often kings would marry the daughters of other kings, set up a deeper relationship with the kingdom. And in their covenants, it would not only talk about the marriage, it would talk about um, how these two kingdoms would now do trade. So it would have this business and social relationship with them. My Old Testament professors in seminary uh, read several of these contracts, not only biblical ones, but ones that didn't have anything biblical about them. And they said there was this real familiar pattern for how they um, enacted. There was always a greater and there was always a lesser. And all of the work and emphasis was put on the lesser. Think about that. That makes sense, right? Um, those that had more, had more opportunities. Um, they might even decide, you know, I'm not renting this plot of land this year because nobody's going to give me what it's worth, and that might affect my rent on all these other plots. You know, the, the person who's just trying to make it, just trying to get by, they're desperate. They'll do what they need to do trying to get by. And all of these contracts um, empowered the greater in the contract and, and were really difficult on the lesser. If we were familiar with those, think how much different this one looked. In it, God is obviously the greater. But what is surprising is how the lessers, Abram and Sarai, benefit. They're the ones who benefit the most, exceedingly more in this contract. And most of the requirements are on the greater. God will make them numerous. God will make them the ancestors of many nations. God will make them the great-grandparents of kings. And God doesn't just change the relationship with Abram. He also changes the relationship with Sarai. I couldn't find a commentator that spoke to this this week, so I texted a buddy of mine that's an Old Testament prof, and he actually wasn't sure, but he said he was intrigued by my question. And my question was, how often were women put in these contracts in positive ways? And what I mean about that was, women would be in the contracts, in the covenants at times, but often it was uh, just having to do with the trade that was going on. They were in it a the same way you might have a cow or an ox or a herd of sheep. They weren't benefactors. Nothing good was necessarily coming for them. But look at this document. Look at this covenant. What does it say about Sarai? She gives rise to nations. Kings of people will come from her. Where the covenants of their day only empowered the greater an act of God empowers even the lowliness, the lowliest in his kingdom, because he is God Almighty. This covenant won't apply only to these two, it will apply to their offspring. And you know, now that we uh, are familiar with DNA and things like that, um, we may find out that we have no DNA in us that leads back to Abraham and Sarai, but they are our spiritual heritage. We trace our spiritual heritage through them. And in this season of Lent, when we metaphorically follow Jesus as he heads towards his death, his disciples thought it was ridiculous and dangerous. It was. Unless we believe we're doing it because of who God is. God Almighty. Everything in this scripture flows out of that understanding. And everything about us is what it needs to be when our identity is based on our relationship with this God. We are the sons and daughters of Sarah and Abraham. But even more than that, we are children of this covenant. Living into this reality doesn't mean our problems will disappear. It doesn't mean that we will get the piece of land we want, we'll get this business deal, we'll get this uh, um, accomplishment or that accomplishment. But it directs our lives in a way of meaning. Because it's based on the only one that can ensure anything goes right in our lives. 
God Almighty. See yourselves within this covenant. Understand who you are as sons of the God Almighty, of the greatest King and only King above all others. That's what we get out of here today. Let us pray. God Almighty, your plan was never in doubt. Your covenant with us always included your Son, Jesus Christ, bearing the cross for our salvation and being raised up from the dead for the redemption of the world. Give us the courage to take up our cross and follow him, that through his grace we may accept the cost of faithful discipleship. Guide us on this Lenten journey as we grow in understanding of what it looks like to follow Jesus, to believe in his promises even as we are experiencing pain. We pray for those that are suffering, both in our church and beyond our walls. We pray for Joe, a member of our presbytery that has long-haul COVID. Bring healing to him and to others. Over two and a half million people have died internationally in this pandemic. But many, many more are suffering from separation, economic hardship, and many side effects of this virus. Bring this time to an end soon, dear Lord. And heal the minds and the bodies that have gone through this toll. Remind us of the everlasting joy of life with Christ and keep us safe until you unite heaven and earth, bringing us together with Jesus, yourself, and the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. Join us at First Presbyterian Church, Sundays at 11 a.m. in our sanctuary, or live-streamed on our website. Or watch us on My 11, every Sunday morning at 9.